morning, New Life Church. How we doing out there? Come on, how we doing out there? There we go. Well, it is so good to be here with you guys. It's great to see all of you. I hope all of you are having a great summer. I hope you had a great fourth. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, it's a little hot this summer. Anybody notice how hot it is? I'm going to tell you what, if hell's this hot, I'm not going. I'm, there's no chance I'm going. Like Tommy said, for me, this definitely feels like a homecoming. And uh, this place holds a special place in the hearts of the Bates family. For those of you I don't know, I know a lot of you, but my wife and I, Cheryl, and we started coming to New Life a little over 20 years ago. And Pastor Rick and Michelle, they've been our pastors now for over 20 years. I'm so thankful for our pastors. And uh, we just, we love it here. I actually, God called us to come on staff here about 13 or 14 years ago. And I was right here in this place. And uh, we had the honor under Pastor Rick and Michelle to be the campus pastors here for a number of years. I got to see my kids get saved here. They were raised here, get baptized in this place. This is definitely a special place. And I just want to say thanks to all of you for continuing to be so faithful to God here. I love the staff here. We have an amazing staff here, and uh, they're just doing a great job. I talk to Marcus, Pastor Marcus, almost every day. Pastor Rick and I are talking to him and hearing all the good things that are happening around here. And I do want to let you know, Pastor Marcus is going to be out for the next couple of weekends. He and Brooke are celebrating 25 years of marriage. And I know what you're thinking. I'm thinking the same thing. We're going to have to get a monument for Brooke, for St. Brooke. 25 years of putting up Marcus Brown? Are you kidding me? We got to get something for that lady. No, I'm just kidding, Marcus. We love you. And uh, I know this, that Pastor Marks and I and all of you, we're so thankful for Pastor Rick and Michelle, the vision for the whole state. I love that this coming Saturday, this coming Saturday, July the 16th, it's going to be a national serve day. There's going to be churches all over the country. Our churches all over the country are going to be serving their community, those that are in need, and we're going to be doing the same thing. Seth Tomboli and the folks up in Fayetteville over to Fort Smith, all the way down to Matt Mosler in Pine Bluff and Corey, Cangelosi and Hot Springs, and every campus in between, definitely right here, we're going to be serving. There's so many opportunities for you to serve this coming Saturday, July the 16th. Pastor Tommy's going to tell you all about it how you can get signed up to serve. I hope you will take the opportunity to do it. It's an amazing opportunity to help other people. And today, I, I want to tell you, that that's what we're talking about, is opportunities that God gives us to further his kingdom. I believe before the day's out, I've been praying all week long that the Holy Spirit's going to speak to every single person in this room. And I believe he is. Because I know those of you that have given your heart to Christ, the Holy Spirit's inside of you. He speaks to you. And I believe he's going to tell you exactly what your next step is in your walk with him. And it's going to look different for every single one of you. But I believe he's going to speak. And I have faith, me included, that every single one of us, we're going to act on what he's asking us to do. And here's what's going to help us today is we're going to dive into the Word of God. I don't know about you, but I'm loving the series in Matthew we're going to go into a great parable today. It is the parable of the talents. So this parable of the talents is one of three parables that Christ tells in the last week of his life. And he tells it. He's actually on the Mount of Olives. And uh, I actually went to the very location. Sherilyn and I got to stand on the very spot where he did this teaching on the Mount of Olives about, about four years or so ago. We got to go to Israel. We got to go to Jerusalem. And we stood there on that mountain. Here's, here's the cool thing. We were at the Mount of Olives on Valentine's Day. Being the romantic guy I am, I love Sherilyn so much. I wanted to hook her up on Valentine's Day. I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get her a limo. It's Valentine's Day. So I called. I got a Jewish limo set up for her and I to ride. Why don't you check out this picture? This Jewish limo I got for her. <laughs> and... Uh, it was kind of a rough ride, though, I'm going to tell you. And it didn't smell real good either. But that was the best I could do. All right, you can take that down. But here's what I want to let you know. This teaching applies to you and I so very well here today. We're going to look at this parable, and I want to give you a little bit of context for this parable before we get into it. When Jesus is teaching this parable, it's on Tuesday, 72 hours before he's going to be crucified. All three parables, he's talking about the end times. Pastor Rick talks about it from, from all the time, about we got to live with the end in mind. And it's very clear that that's what Jesus, that's what he's saying to us. And in this parable, here's what you're going to see, that there's an owner 
And that owner is Jesus. It says the owner's going to go away for a long time. He's been gone for 2,000 years. I feel like that's a long time, right? But he says he's coming back. And the owner says that he has entrusted his wealth, that he has blessed his servants. The servants, that's you and that's me. We are his stewards. We are his managers. My house, my car, my clothes, it's all on loan from Jesus. I don't own it. It's his. I am just a manager of what he has given to me. So now, let's look at this parable. We're going to go verse by verse little expository teaching here today, and then we got a few points for you at the end. Here we go. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. It says, again, and again, he's talking about the end times, again, it will be like a man, this is Jesus, going on a journey who called his servants, and he entrusted his wealth to them. He blessed them. He blessed them with his wealth. Does anybody in here feel blessed today in this house? I mean, I'll come on. I mean, we woke up this morning. If you woke up this morning and you had air conditioning in your house, you had running water, you are blessed. If you got in a vehicle today and you got to drive a vehicle from your house to this building, I'm going to tell you what, you are blessed. It's hot out there. If you went to the refrigerator this morning, you had some cold milk, some cold juice, let me tell you what, you're blessed. If you went to the pantry, you had food in there. You had choices for breakfast. You are blessed. Like some of you may have fruity pebbles. Some of you may have some cocoa puffs. I think we ought to take a vote. I want to see where my fruity pebbles people are and my cocoa puffs people are. I'm a fruity pebbles guy. Where's my fruity pebbles people? Come on. All right, where's the cocoa puffs? All you people addicted to chocolate, man. I'll tell you what. Y'all, y'all need to see a doctor. But here's what I want to let you know. I've seen some studies that show Like the the lowest 10th percentile, the poorest 10th percentile of the people living in the United States of America today, that they would be royalty. They would literally be considered royalty by the way they live if they had lived 125 to 150 years ago. And, of course, for 6,000 years before then. We are blessed. Let's look at verse 15. In verse 15, it, it says, To one he gave five bags of gold. To another he gave two bags to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. I know what some of you are thinking. Well, that's not fair. Why did one guy only get five? It should be equal. Listen, that's not the way life works. Not everybody's a winner. I mean, you're going to lose sometimes. You're going to win sometimes. That's just not the way it works. But we serve a fair God, and he is a good God. I've only seen one time where he's not fair, and I am so very thankful he wasn't fair. If we serve a fair God, you and me would have had to go to that cross for our sins. But I'm thankful that God wasn't fair, but he is good, and that Jesus went to the cross for every single one of us. If you're thankful for that, let's give Jesus a hand in this house today. But I want to look at this. Some of you are thinking, still thinking the God's not fair. Let me tell you what. I would gladly be the guy that just got one talent. Because let me tell you, one talent of gold. And today would be well over a million dollars. For today, we'll just call it a million bucks. Let me tell you what. If I would got a million dollars, like I'd be breakdancing up here, man. I, I could show you some moves. We don't have time. But, but I'm just telling you, I would be going crazy if somebody came in here and handed me a million dollars today. The first thing I would do, I would tie the $100,000. I'd give 10% back to God because I'm not the owner. That's his million. I'm just being a steward. I would probably, honestly, immediately after that, I'd probably give another hundred or 150,000 of that blessing. I'd probably give it back to planning campuses, to City Serve, to Dream Center, so that we could reach more people, so that we can continue to make a difference in people's lives. We might have a little party at the base house real quick, too. I mean, come on, you got to enjoy it a little bit. But here's what I want to tell you here's the important part of this it says that God blessed them according to their ability. It's back to we have a good God. He knows what you can handle, and he knows what I can handle. Have you ever seen somebody get too much blessing, get too much money, and they just can't handle it? Anybody ever heard of Mike Tyson? Like that dude made $300 million in his boxing career. And then a few years later, it was gone. He had to file for bankruptcy. I mean, he lost it all. He couldn't handle it. Let me give you a perfect example. It's documented. Go look at it. They said that Mike Tyson went out and bought a $2 million bathtub. 
Are you kidding me? Men, we don't even take baths. Don't claim that you take a bath if you're a man. We'll take your man car right now. Men, we take showers. He bought a $2 million bathtub. That man is crazy. Look, God knows what we can handle. Let's look at the next verse, verse 16. It says, the man who had received five bags of gold, okay? He received five talents, over five million of gold. He went at once. I think you should underline at once in your notes. At once. And he put his money to work, and he gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold, he gained two more. With a sense of urgency, they were so thankful, felt so blessed for what their master, for what God had done for them, they went and put it to work. They, they were, hey, had some urgency, like some of you. I've seen some of you, like on Black Friday. I see pictures of you on Black Friday. I know what you do. You get at Best Buy at like 2 in the morning. You try to get at the front of the line, and the second those doors open at 7, you're throat-punching everybody because you're going to get that at new HDTV. I know how you people are. But this is exactly the type of urgency these guys saw because of the blessing. But the other one, the third guy, unfortunately, he went a different route. In verse 18, it says, But the man who had received one bag, he went off and he dug a hole in the ground and he hid his master's money. Can you believe this? Like if I came and handed somebody a million dollars, I'm going to give you a million dollars to use this blessing for God, for his kingdom. And you went and dug a hole in the ground and buried it? I'd slap you right upside your head and I'd snatch my money back so fast you wouldn't even be able to see it. I, I mean, I can't believe this. But here's what I know is, none of us, you know, wake up and say, God, teach me how to waste my life. No, none of us want to waste our life. None of us want to waste the blessings. But sometimes we do it. Sometimes, sometimes it happens. I want to look here at Matthew chapter 25, the next verse, verse 19. It says, after a long time. After a long time, the master of those servants, he returned and he settled accounts with them. I need you to know, he's coming back. And when he comes back, he's going to settle accounts with us. There's going to be a real heaven, there's going to be a real hell, and he's going to settle accounts with us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. I want to tell you what, I've heard Pastor Rick say it many times. One day we're going to stand before, before Jesus, we're going to stand before before God there, and he's going to ask us two questions. The first question is going to be this. What did you do with my son Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection? And then secondly, what did you do with the blessing I gave you? The time, the opportunities, the gifts, the talents, the financial resources. Like, what did you do with it? Did you use it for me and my kingdom? Or did you waste it? Let's go on here. Let's look at verse 20. It says, The man who had received five bags of gold, he brought the other five. And he said, Master, he said, You entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. I, I want to give you some examples. Here's what I think. I think one of them, it's like this. Like, God, you gave me a gift of hospitality. So I went to the church and I signed up to be on the greet team. And I, I'm greeting almost every weekend and just welcoming people in. There was another person who said, you know, Lord, I know you gave me this gift for compassion and, and love for kids. So I went and signed up to serve in Little Life and Kid Life. And like three or four times a month, like I'm serving back there, God. There was a businessman who came up and said, God, I know you gave me business acumen. And, and I took that, Lord. And I started three or four businesses. And they're all making money. And, and I'm tithing off that money, and I'm giving back over and above that to your kingdom, to everything. That's exactly what this is about right here. And look at the master's response. His master replied, Well done, thy good and faithful servant, with a big exclamation point. He is so proud of his servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Like he just wants us to share in his happiness. Do you know that God, he just wants to bless you. But I love this. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. I love this. That he ends up saying, well done. 
I want you to come share in my happiness. The guy that just made two more got to share just like the guy that made five because he was equally uh, protective. And he, he equally took that and advanced it for God's kingdom. I love seeing that. And here's what I know is, more than anything in life, Pastor Rick and I and, and Marcus and this team want to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. We're standing there. And it's your turn to come before the Father. That's what we want to hear. I, I have to tell you, if there's one thing that keeps us up at night as pastors, it's thinking about the fact that some of the people we love, some of the people we know might walk up before him and they don't get to hear well done. That's what keeps us up at night. If you want to know what keeps us up at night, it's that right there. Because here's what happens to the third guy. The third guy in verse 24 he says this, Then the man who received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man. I don't know how he knew that. Harvesting where you've not sown, gathering where you've not scattered seeds. So I was afraid, and I went out, and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. He wasted his life. He wasted the time he was given. He wasted the opportunities he was given. He wasted all the gifts and talents he was given. He wasted the financial... Re he wasted it all. I pray that not one person here watching online with us right now would ever waste what God has given to us. I, I've, there's a great verse that I love, and I think we should take it to heart today. It's in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. It says this, Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Why? Because the days are evil. I don't know about you, but we live in evil days, and we have to be wise and aware of how we're using our time, our gifts, and our resources. So here's what I want to do. I want to take the next few minutes, and I want to look at three reasons why I believe this third guy, and some of you, unfortunately, might be able to relate to this guy, but I believe it can all change today. I believe it can all change today, but I want to look at three reasons why I believe he wasted the blessing. The first one is this, is that he had a wrong view of God. And if we're not careful, we can get a wrong view of God. Listen, I, I know that sometimes we don't see God for who he really is. Sometimes I don't see you guys when I see you away from here the way you normally are. Like I see you here in church, you all look good. You're looking sharp today. You're all put together. I saw the staff came in. I was like, man, Dale, you look really good. You're looking sharp. I saw Mark Davis. He looks so good. But I saw Mark Davis the other day. I was out at Walmart, and I almost didn't recognize him. Like, I ran into him. I was like, Mark, that doesn't even look like you. Look, they got a picture of him. There he is at Walmart. <laughs> I'm like, Mark Davis, what's the deal with the headband and the shorts all rolled up? I'm like, Mark, what is this? And then I remembered like a few years back, you know, I remember a long time ago, LSU used to be good at football. It's been a long time. But years ago, I ran into Marcus on game day when LSU had a big game and I saw him strutting around in his tiger suit at Walmart. I'm like, Marcus, what are you doing? That's not even the right tiger suit. But anyway, here's the real truth. Sometimes we don't recognize God for who he really is. And it's very clear this guy did not recognize the God we serve. Listen to what he said again. Let's read it again in verse 24. He says, Then the man who had received one bag of gold came master he said i know that you are a hard man how did he know that i don't see anything hard or mean about somebody that comes and hands me a million dollars that's my best friend i don't know about you like that's my new best friend there's nothing hard about that that's a good god but here's what i know i know my wife and i know some other folks that they were raised in maybe some some very legalistic church backgrounds and they were taught that man god is he just can't wait to punish you and he just, he just cannot wait to hit you right over the head. And some of you, you, you listen to God and you get tricked into believing that God, he has it out for you. But that's not true. Over 175 times in the word of God, Jesus, he called the father, he called him Abba. Abba is translated as daddy. I want you to look at this verse, Mark 14, 36. It says, Abba, father. Let me tell you what that says. That's, that's daddy, daddy. Daddy, Daddy, Jesus said, everything is possible for you. Did you know that we can go to the Father and we can say, Daddy, Daddy, I had this impossible situation, but I know it's not too big for you. 
I know you can take this. Listen, it doesn't mean that he's not just and fair. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But he is a good God that has the best in store for you. And this guy didn't see it, and I pray you see it. The second reason that I believe this guy wasted his blessing is, is that he allowed fear to control him. And if we're not careful, fear can control us. Any of you have ever had fear control you before? I know that there's been times in my life where I have done it. Here recently, some of us on staff, we were talking to a counselor in this area, and they were telling us that there, there really is a, a small number of people that live here in Maumel, North Little Rock, and the Sherwood area, in this area, that they have a tremendous fear of crossing over bridges, crossing over water. And there's a small group of people that have never one time in their life crossed over that 430 River Bridge. They are fearful of crossing that bridge. There's people on the south side, I guarantee you, they have the same fear of crossing over. To me, that just it doesn't seem rational. But to them, that's where fear is controlling them. I've read studies on fear. I read this one study that showed that the number two fear of people is the fear of death. The number one fear of people is the fear of public speaking. So I want you to think about this. The next time you go to a funeral, there's more people that would rather be in the coffin than actually up on stage speaking. Now, that doesn't make sense to me. Not at all. But whether it's rational or irrational, I want to tell you what fear can control us. And I want to look at this guy. It was clear that fear controlled this man's decision. Look at verse 24. Look, I'm sorry, verse 25. He said, so I was afraid. And I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Fear of failure got the best of this guy. The fear of failure and being punished got the best of him. I have to tell you what, I don't struggle with that fear. But there's times, I'm being honest today... I've struggled with a fear of man before. But I know what the Word says about it. And I'm making sure it doesn't control me anymore. In Proverbs 29, verse 25, it says, The fear of man will prove to be a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord will be kept safe. Anytime that tries to creep in, I'm like, I don't care. I'm not going to care about what people think of me. I know this, God. I care about what you think and what you say. And I'm going to do what you say. And I'm not going to worry about what they think. Because here's the response that this guy got back in verse 26. His master replied, this is Jesus. Jesus replied, you wicked, lazy servant. He is a good, loving God. But he's also a just God. And he's a just God that's going to have to judge us one day. And unfortunately for this person, he had been lazy. And he had been wasteful. And he had wasted the time, the talents the financial resources that God had given to him. Whether it's fear of failure, fear of man, or whatever your fear may be, I just pray that we would never let fear keep us from the best that God has for us. And the third and final thing I want to share with you is the third reason that he, he failed is that he procrastinated. And if we're not careful, we can procrastinate. Anybody in here are procrastinators? The real ones won't raise their hand for a long time. And, uh, but you ever been driving down the road and you see a squirrel dead in the road? Well, procrastination and indecision killed him. I mean, he sees this car coming for a long time. And he's going, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. I'll, I'll get. And then in a minute, he's like, should I go left? Should I go right? And then bam, I mean, it's over. Like procrastination killed him. But listen, it's got us too before. And here's what I believe. There's a lot of really smart people listening online right here today. You're really smart people, but even bigger than that, those of you that surrendered your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit is inside of you. And I believe that you know what you should do. The Lord's been speaking to me about something all week long, and I'm doing it. And I believe the Lord is speaking to you about what is your next step. And here's what I know, that procrastination is assassination of a really great future God has for you. And I I know this, procrastination has killed more God-given dreams than anything else out there. And I know this, some of you, you know you need to get baptized. It's time to do it. Some of you, you know you need to start reading your Bible every day. Let's do it. Some of you know the Lord's calling you to start tithing. You know that the Lord is calling you to forgive somebody and stop carrying around all that bitterness. Like, it's time to do it. But sometimes we just convince ourselves we can do it later. 
I want you to write this down. Please write this statement down. I want you to, when you tell God, I'll get around to it later, I want you to know this, that delayed obedience is immediate disobedience. Delayed obedience is immediate disobedience to God. I, we can't tell God, I'll get around to it later. I remember when I was right, my kids were little. Like if I'd gone up to their room and I said, hey, we got some friends coming over. I need you to pick up your clothes. I need you to make your bed, clean up your room. If they said, hey, Dad, I'll get around to it later, let me tell you what. I brought you in this world. I'll take you out right now. You will clean up this room now. You're not going to do it later. You're going to do it now. Or I'm going to get around to whipping your tail now. Like we're not going to do it later. But here's what I know. The master's return caught the third guy by surprise. I don't want any of you to be caught by surprise. As one of your pastors, that's the last thing we ever want is for one of you to get caught by surprise. But, but listen what happens when you continue to put off what you know you should do and the master returns. Here's what happens. The last three verses, 28, 29, and 30 of Matthew 25. So take the bag of gold from him. Give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's a real heaven. There's a real hell. I know that I'm believing, that Pastor Rick and our staff are believing that, that everybody in here, that we're going to answer these two questions today and for the rest of our life. The two questions are, what did you do with my son Jesus? his death, burial, and resurrection. And secondly, what did you do with the time on earth, the opportunities I gave you every day? What did you do with the gifts and ability I gave you? What did you do with the financial resources? Did you use them? Did you multiply them? Did you use them for my glory, for my kingdom? Or did you waste them? Here's what I want you to do today before we go. In your notes, if you got your notes at the very bottom of the notes, we put on there, my next step. And then we put a big long blank. I want every one of you to write down, what is your next step? I want you to commit to God, make a commitment between you and God today. What your next step is. For some of you, maybe you need to get on a serve team. And you need to write it down. You need to fill out a connect card today too, and you need to turn it in. For some of you, you need to get into a life group, and you need to sign up today. Do it. Some of you know you need to be leading a life group. Write it down. Put it on a connect card. Let a pastor know, I'm ready to lead a life group. I know I've been given leadership gifts. i got to get after it. I'm not wasting any more time. Some of you, you know you need to start tithing or maybe tithing faithfully. Well, start today. Do it today. Write it down. Like, I, I believe you know what your next step is. Let's not wait any longer. 